I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on Introduction and Innovations in High-Speed Quantitative Nanomechanical Imaging. I'm Jason Cleveland, your moderator, and this is the first in a three-part series on the opportunities, challenges, and frontiers of nanomechanical measurements with AFM. Your presenter today is AFM pioneer, inventor, and Asylum's co-founder, Roger Prooks. He'll talk about a variety of nanomechanical techniques, some old, some new, some tried, and some not so true. During the presentation, to ask a question, just expand the control panel on the upper right of your screen and type in your question. This panel may already be expanded. If not, just click the red arrow. Feel free to enter questions during the presentation, and at the end, we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time allotted. If you miss any portion of this webinar, you can view the archived version at a later date using the same link you just used to log in. So let's get started. Roger? Thanks for the introduction, Jason. As the title suggests, I'm going to first introduce a few general ideas in mechanical and specifically nanomechanical measurements. Uh, then I'm going to spend the majority of the time discussing two new measurement techniques, lost tangent and AMFM. These are based around AC mode, otherwise known as tapping mode imaging. And because they're based around tapping mode imaging, they're very easy to use, uh, very fast, and very robust. Before I get started, I want to just spend a moment uh, remembering Monty Heaton. Uh, we lost Monty unexpectedly a couple weeks back. Uh, he was our executive vice president of marketing. Uh, and he was really an old school AFM guy. If you've been in the business for very long at all, of course you knew him. Uh, and even if you haven't been, if you've used an AFM, there's a decent chance uh, it was one that he maybe named or at least wrote about uh, in an app note. We miss him. Okay, now getting into the presentation. Nanomech Pro is a suite of tools for characterizing the mechanical properties of materials on the nanoscale. Lost Tangent and AMFM are part of that general set of tools and techniques that are available to our customers. They provide high-resolution, sensitive probes of the sample stiffness and other properties. During this webinar, we'll be talking about Lost Tangent and AMFM imaging, as I mentioned. Uh, we'll be following this up with a couple of presentations. One uh, will be our second presentation in July, where we'll discuss force curves including some very sophisticated analysis tools that allow you to fit your data to Hertz, JK, DMT, and other models, including Oliver Farr. Uh, we'll be discussing a number of other nanomechanical techniques, such as force modulation, uh, which is essentially dynamic mechanical analysis, indentation, and contact resonance measurements. In early fall, probably in September, we'll be following that up with functional mechanical measurements. By functional, I mean things where you turn a knob and it changes the mechanical properties. So things like temperature, electric fields, and so on. Electrochemical strain microscopy is one example. Piezo response force microscopy. And we'll be looking at, at our thermal module, so Z-therm and scanning thermal microscopy, where you can measure thermal conductivity and other properties um, of, of mechanical samples. Uh, I should also say that we provide a variety of reference and test samples and that uh, you should keep an eye on it because there's more uh, of these sorts of measurements coming along. Okay, for today's presentation, um, I'm going to start out talking about the difference between accurate and quantitative measurements. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time introducing you to the idea of the storage and the loss modulus and the loss tangent, since we'll be using those uh, labels, those words a lot. Uh, I'll talk about the difference, difference between stiffness and modulus, and we'll see how the tip shape uh, can very much affect the modulus measurement. If you aren't familiar with a lot of the ideas, uh, viscoelastic theory and so on, I really like the book by Roderick Lakes and Ferry, uh, Viscoelastic Materials and Viscoelastic Properties of Polymers. Uh, you might want to check those out if you're uh, interested in reading more. Since we're looking at tapping mode, uh, we're going to talk about contrast in tap tapping mode, and historically how it has provided high resolution uh, on a huge variety of samples. What we've done now is we've added two capabilities to this tried and true mode, uh, loss tangent and AM-FM imaging, and those provide quantitative nanomechanical measurements that go along with these beautiful high resolution uh, topography measurements. Uh, 
Uh, finally, we're focusing mostly on polymers. I'm going to show you a lot of examples, and I'm going to do some things at high speed. We'll actually explore making quantitative elasticity modulus maps. And we'll finish with looking at some high resolution results, the lamella, lamella <laughs> excuse me, in polypropylene and uh, point atomic defects in uh, calcite. Of course, we would all like our nanomechanical measurements to be fast, easy, and very, very accurate. In general, accurate nanomechanical measurements, as with other kinds of measurements, are difficult to perform. There are many experimental parameters that need to be carefully calibrated. And even with careful calibration, the experimental uncertainties can still be quite large. I made this little table as a sort of map of the trade-offs associated with various measurement techniques. Basically, the faster the measurement, the speedier, if you will, uh, the, the less accurate and the more susceptible it, it will be to artifacts, calibration uncertainties, and other inconveniences. On the other hand, sometimes getting a rough answer quickly can be very valuable just as a check to see if you're on the right track or if your materials are behaving the way you expect them to. If you want the best, most accurate measurement, chances are it will take some time. Instead of say, uh, calling it slow, I called it meticulous, but that's really um, what it ends up being. It, it takes more time. It's slower. It requires you to know quite a few of the technical details of both the technique and the interpretation, and you may need to make uh, measurements using a variety of techniques. The two techniques I'm going to focus on today, loss tangent and AMFM, are fast, easy, and provide quantitative images of the sample stiffness in the loss tangent, basically the ratio of the dissipated to the stored energy on a wide variety of samples. Because they're based on tapping or AC mode, they're fast, easy, and quite adaptable. You can do it on samples with hundreds of nanometers of roughness down to samples with single atomic defects. We recommend verifying any of these measurements. If, there, if you really need to have an accurate number, we, we recommend verifying these with other kinds of tools. Uh, for example, indentation, force modulation, contact resonance, just to name a few. As I mentioned before, stiffness is a property that is often of great interest. It's hard to talk, talk about stiffness without mentioning Hooke's Law. Robert Hooke was a contemporary and a pretty famous rival of Isaac Newton. Hooke's law states that the force required to change a dimension of a material depends on the change multiplied by this spring constant. It's a linear relationship, so if we make a graph of it, it looks like a straight line. Um, and what that means is that if we change this elongation by a factor of two, the force also changes by a factor of two. Many, many materials follow a linear Hooke's law, at least for small deformations. At some point, they'll start to deviate from that, however. Um, you'll enter in what we call the plastic region. If you keep stretching this material or, or crushing it, um, you'll get to the breaking point or the yield point. We can also define a couple other points on this graph. This proportional limit is the limit beyond, if you stretch it beyond this uh, length, uh, the force is no longer linear. If you push it beyond that, it's no longer linear. You can also define the elastic limit. What that means is that if you stretch or you push it beyond this delta L value here and you return back to zero force, uh, you'll see that the elongation uh, does not return to zero. That is that we've sort of permanently deformed or plastically deformed the material. The spring constant is also referred to as the stiffness. So in the case of pushing on the sample here, this little orange bar, uh, the spring constant is, that, is the stiffness of that orange bar. It's an extrinsic material property in that it depends on the material, but it also depends on the geometry, of the structure of the object. So if I change the shape of that bar, uh, turn it into a spring or double the size or something like that, in general the stiffness will also change. Uh, we'll talk about Young's modulus, which is an intrinsic material property, and that should not depend on the geometry. So most materials deform by only a percent or so until they yield, until we get to this breaking point here, although some polymers and rubbers can deform by well over 100%. Finally, I should note that, the, that many materials have a time-dependent stiffness or time-dependent modulus. That is, they relax. 
For nanomechanical measurements, it means that the stiffness of the modulus depends on how rapidly the measurement is made. Put another way, there's a frequency dependence to the measurement. So far, we've focused on measurements of stiffness, uh, which has units of newtons per meter, the spring constant of the material. Uh, the, what's been gaining a lot of attention lately is this uh, measurement, the possibility of measuring uh, modulus, which is an intrinsic property which should be independent of the geometry of the material. As I'm going to discuss in the next couple slides, I think that's a really difficult thing to measure, and uh, we'll get right into why now. So Young's modulus allows you to calculate the change in dimension of a piece of material. Uh, if we think about an isotropic elastic material, if you stretch it under or compress it, it predicts how much the material extends or shortens under those, under those forces. Um, you may have to, to do it in real materials. You may have to worry about things like the shear modulus, density, or Poisson's ratio. But it's an intrinsic material property that should be independent of the geometry. So Young defined the stress, which is F over A, where A is this area over which the force is applied. Gave it the Greek letter sigma. And if you divide that by the strain, which is the change in length along this direction of the force, divided by the starting length, epsilon, um, those two things are connected by this thing called Young's modulus, the E. Now, it's basically Young's modulus on the same graph. I, I changed the axes to be stress and strain. Young's modulus is the slope along that elastic um, region. Now, there's lots of materials that are anisotropic where Young's modulus may have different values depending on the direction of the applied force, um, but uh, we're going to be fairly simple in all of uh, all the stuff we do. So stiffness, as I said, is an in, in extrinsic property. It depends on the material and geometry. The idea is if you double the material, it doubles the stiffness. And what that means in, in the case of, of nanomechanical measurements is that real AFM tips have a physical shape. And so they're going to have a shape that, depend, that, that will determine how much contact they make with the sample. So the details of the shape have important consequences as to how much of that material is being actually touched by the probe. This contact area is going to depend on the, on the shape, the loading force, adhesion, and other uh, other uh, factors. And the idea is that if you take this material which has a certain contact area and you measure a K sample, all I have to do is if I double that contact area, so now I'm touching twice as much material, I'm going to measure twice the stiffness. Now these are the same exact materials, so I'm measuring twice the stiffness, but that's not telling us anything intrinsic about the sample. It's telling us something about the contact area instead. So one of the most uh, popular nanomechanical models is the so-called Hertz model, uh, developed by Heinrich Hertz, uh, I guess, in 1881. Uh, I think he was 20-some years old, 22 years old or something. Uh, I was on Christmas break, and he had been studying lenses being pressed together and the stresses uh, as these lenses were pressed together. So he derived an expression uh, that connects the sample stiffness what we're calling sample stiffness, uh, with the Young's modulus and the contact radius. And so if you take this sharp point and you press down with a force, a loading force, this ti the tip of this point has a radius R, uh, and it indents inside your sample a, a, a distance delta. Hertz derived this expression between the contact radius and the loading force, the, uh, the, the tip shape, or the tip radius, and Young's modulus. So the promise here, or the idea here, is that <clears throat> you have this very, very nice and simple uh, relationship between Young's modulus and the stiffness that you measure. Unfortunately, for AFMs, uh, we really have to say it's not that simple. And I'll tell you why right now. This idea of a simple tip is really great. Unfortunately, it doesn't survive much examination. The Hertz model is really nice. I mean, look at that. It's, it's simple. You can uh, 
uh, make nice calculations about the indentation depth, the elasticity, and so on. Um, and indeed, we'll make some of those uh, calculations as this webinar series goes on. But with a little examination, this simple sphere model uh, is pretty quickly debunked. In general, tips aren't simple. They're messy, non-ideal, and they change over time. I did a little web of science search. Uh, in fact, it's a couple years old now. Uh, and if you, all you have to do is type in uh, tip shape into the web of science and force measurements, maybe AFM, and, and you get lots and lots of hits. Here's a reference um, from 2005 where they have some SEM photos of tips. Uh, you can see they're far from ideal. Uh, the one on the right is maybe a little ideal, but it's not exactly a sphere. It's not exactly a cone. Uh, here's another series of shots uh, from the same group uh, where they're looking at tip wear. And in this series of shots, I mean, the, the size of the tip, the, the radius, contact radius, if you can even define one, ranges over several orders of magnitude, and the tip shapes are very, very uh, complicated and, and change um, from tip to tip. Maybe the most disturbing thing is that uh, tip change as we're scanning. AFM is a mechanical process and so sometimes the tips wear. They may also pick up uh, debris and so on that change their interaction uh, shape. The bottom line here is that absolute accurate modulus measurements are really tough to make. Stiffness measurements, uh, the AFM is good at that, relatively good anyway. It may even be possible to make absolute stiffness measurements, but the intrinsic modulus, Young's modulus, that's really tough because of this tip shape uncertainty. I won't say it's impossible to make, um, but despite what the competition likes to say sometimes, it's really difficult. The mechanical measurements we've been talking about so far uh, are what we might call low frequency or DC measurements, meaning that we make them well below the cantilever resonance, and certainly force curves, even fast force curves, um, are made usually well, well below the, the first resonant frequency. On the other hand, um, there's been a lot of success over the years uh, using AC mode, where we, we operate the cantilever close to its resonant frequency. Um, this is also known as tapping mode. Uh, one, of the, one of the nice advantages of this AC or tapping mode is that the simple harmonic oscillator that I've abbreviated SHO, uh, it acts as a, as a filter, or sort of an amplifier for weak signals. The quality factor of the cantilever, of the oscillator, is typically an error somewhere between 100 and 300. And what that effectively means is that we multiply that signal at resonance by a factor of 100 or 300. Um, also, since it's at fairly high frequencies, we can escape a lot of forms of noise that are common to experimental apparatus, apparati, uh, 1 over F noise, uh, vibration, building vibrations, acoustic noise, and so on. So when we do that, we're basically measuring the effects of the tip sample interaction averaged over some number of cycles as the tip taps on that surface. Um, and that's, that's actually that time averaging, that built-in time averaging is actually what helps us uh, have such a spectacular signal to noise. So one of my favorite examples of that, of course, is an image like this, which was taken on the Cypher, where you can see a frame up and a frame down of an AC mode, tapping mode image of single atomic defects uh, in a calcite crystal surface. And so the signal to noise on this is, is quite spectacular. It's uh, very difficult to do with any other sort of technique. In AC and tapping mode, since we're, we're hitting the sample with a periodic force, uh, it makes sense to talk about the dynamic moduli. So in other words, instead of talking about Young's modulus as a time dependent, uh, quantity, we're going to move into frequency space and talk about the frequency response. Uh, in, in, this, um, in, in frequency dependent moduli, we imagine applying an oscillatory stress to the sample and uh, at the same frequency there's a response. Now the response can be in phase, in which case you're measuring the storage modulus, uh, or out of phase, in which case you're measuring the loss modulus. Now examples of materials with large storage moduli uh, include stiff metals, ceramics, glasses, and so on, things that you think of as elastic. 
Examples of materials with um, large loss moduli would be liquids like water. Um, most of the uh, most of the energy that you put into it is dissipated as heat or other other kinds of uh, basically lost energy. Um, now the loss tangent is defined as the ratio of those two quantities, and in general, most materials are neither perfect um, are. are dissipate some energy and store some energy and so viscoelastic materials they both they do both dissipate and store it and examples of those of course include uh, uh, most polymers since we're talking about material properties I thought it would be useful to look at um, the range of material properties the loss tangent and the elastic modulus I took this um, figure from a paper by Ashby in 1989, adapted a little bit, colored it up a little bit. It's a really nice little um, uh, paper. I recommend it. Um, what he did is he plotted the elastic modulus um, of materials, so ranging from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the 3 gigapascal along the x-axis. Now, this does not include a lot of very, very soft biomaterials, for example. That's actually, they can be down in the kilopascal range, so this only goes down to megapascal or so. Um, and then the loss tangent is along the vertical axis up here. That ranges from 10 to the minus 5 to 10. Um, as we go up in the loss tangent, so these materials down here that are relatively stiff and have low loss tangents, things like glasses and certain kinds of ceramics. Uh, you know these materials and you know that they have low loss tangents because if you happen to hit them with a hammer or uh, not break them but, but uh, give them a little impact, they'll ring like a bell. They'll make a very nice single tone. You'll be able to identify that tone and it will go on for a long time because they're not lossy. Uh, as we go up in the metals, uh, you can reduce the loss tangent. The loss tangent I'm sorry, increases, so you increase the damping um, without reducing the stiffness too much. Um, but you'll see that, you know, for the example of a lead alloy, you know that a lead alloy with a, with a loss tangent of 10 to the minus 2 doesn't make a very nice belt, sort of makes more of a thunk or a thud. Um, as we go through the polymers, they get softer, so they range from maybe, maybe 100 uh, gigapascal down to the megapascal range, so polymers and um, uh, wood and things like that. Uh, and then as we get into the elastomers, the rubbers and so on, uh, some kinds of foams, the the stiffness goes way down and the loss tangent goes way up. So maybe one of these butyl rubbers, if you uh, drop that on the floor, it doesn't, it doesn't ring nicely. It makes more of a splat sound. So we can think about this graph uh, in terms of materials. What I've drawn on the right hand side of the screen here is a drive. So I'm, you know, think of this drive as it could be your finger poking uh, a sample sinusoidally. It could also be an AFM tip pressed into a sample and, and driving it back and forth sinusoidally. So we're applying a force or a stress to the, uh, to the material and the response of that material is plotted in the solid curve here. Now in this case, because the response is in phase, it's lined up with the drive, we call that an elastic material, an elastic response. Many, many materials, so this is, this is what uh, all this stuff down here with really low loss tangents would look like that, so, uh, metals and so on. Uh, if we take some uh, polymers or rubbers and we drive those, what we'll see is that that response has a phase shift. It's out of phase. It lags behind. Uh, and those materials we call viscoelastic. Now this phase angle, um, the, the angle between the drive and the response, uh, depends on this loss tangent. We can take that, that uh, phase angle of 80 degrees here, plot that tangent, and we see that that's the sort of uh, loss tangent you'd expect for one of these very lossy butyl rubbers or, or some, some other elastomer. Uh, if we reduce that phase angle a little bit, so this green curve here, that gives us a loss tangent of 1, so it's still in the elastomers. Um, we can further reduce it. There's 0.1, so that's maybe more typical for polymers. Um, we start to see that that phase angle is kind of getting a little bit more difficult to uh, measure. Um, we'll re reduce it even further down to 0.01, and you see that it gets 
actually quite hard to, to separate from the, the in-phase uh, component. Again, and since it's a logarithmic scale, that, that phase angle is, becomes very, very tiny. Uh, and I zoomed in there just so you can see that. Now, this is interesting because is, if, if we're poking on this, or if we're applying this force with a cantilever, uh, the cantilever is going to have some measurement noise. And so if you take for a typical AC240 cantilever, the thermal, the Brownian motion of that, that gives you about a, a, a phase angle error of about 0.3 degrees. What that means is that for that, that AC240 cantilever, the loss tangents below that red line there, the 0.01, um, are basically not accessible. They're, they're masked by the experimental noise. And if you look in the literature in phase imaging and force modulation and so on, you'll see that, that for many cases, uh, loss tangents, uh, materials that like metals and ceramics and so on, uh, aren't measurable with, uh, with phase imaging and with force modulation techniques. That isn't quite the case with contact resonance. Um, that actually can improve our signal to noise and so we can dip down into some of those harder materials. And we'll discuss that in a in a later webinar. Uh, okay, I think we're ready to move on. At this point, it would be useful to talk a little bit about um, resonant modes in cantilevers. Cantilevers are extended mechanical objects, and because of that, they have uh, a large number nearly infinite number of what are called normal modes or resonant modes. Uh, we use these resonant modes for imaging. Uh, usually we just use the first mode, which is mode number one uh, that I've pointed out in this little table here. Uh, so for an AC240, the spring constant of that first mode is about uh, 2 newtons per meter. The one I'm working with here has a, a resonant frequency of about 82 kilohertz. Um, the next modes up have frequencies that are given by this expression here, so 2, 3, 4, where i is 2, 3, 4, is um, the first frequency times this constant c. The dynamic spring constant, the stiffness of that mode, goes like this number c squared. So if we look at the first mode, it looks like this. The shape is up like this. It bends. It looks a little bit just like a deflecting cantilever. You can see here is a tune and it's centered around 8, 82 kilohertz, something like that. The next mode, second mode, here at um, 505 kilohertz is shaped like this. It has a node here in the center, basically where the, the, you know, the cantilever is not moving. The third mode looks like this, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. And you can see the frequencies go up. I've shown measured tunes, so 1.4 megahertz, 2.7, 4.33, and 6.35. Now, the thing that's interesting to notice about this, and we'll get back to this at some point, is that the stiffness of these modes uh, goes up like this number squared. So this six mode, for example, is considerably more stiff uh, than, than the first mode. AMFM and loss tangent imaging relies on measuring properties of not one but two of the resonant modes from a cantilever. And I'm going to show you how that works right now. So just as for normal sort of tapping or AC mode, we take an oscillating voltage and we drive a shake piezo that shakes the cantilever up and down, usually at its first resonance. We measure that deflection with this little blue curve here. That goes back to the controller and is analyzed in a lock-in. And in that lock-in, you calculate the amplitude and the phase. Now, that amplitude and phase can be used and, and will be used to cal calculate the loss tangent. The amplitude signal also goes into a feedback calculation and uh, controls the tip sample distance and gives us an image of the sample topography. So out of that first mode, we get topography and loss tangent. And because we are controlling the amplitude, we call that an amplitude modulated or an AM signal. Now the second mode, an, or a second mode, can also be excited at the same time. We do that with the same kind of setup. We have an oscillator here. We sum that voltage into um, the shake piezo. 
And now the response, instead of just being a simple sine wave, is a sine wave with a tiny little extra sine wave on top. That's that second resonant mode. That signal goes back. Again, one signal is analyzed in the first lock-in. And then the second lock-in is tuned to that second higher frequency mode. We use that second higher frequency mode. I won't go through all the details here, but we run it in something called a phase lock loop that keeps it at its resonant frequency. And in that case, the output of that, this resonant frequency output of that, tells us about the tip sample stiffness, or I, I labeled it elasticity here. I'm not going to talk about dissipation today. We'll do that at some later time. But because we are modulating the frequency to keep the phase constant, we call this frequency modulation, or FM. And so out of the second mode, the FM signal gives us elasticity. One more time, out of the first mode, we get topography and loss tangent. And then out of the second mode, we'll get a measure of the sample elasticity. Now, as a sort of teaser before we start discussing exactly the origins and how we quantify this stuff, I'm just going to show you a couple examples of how we can use loss tangent and AM-FM imaging to uh, study samples. This is a, a graphene sample. Uh, the graphene was deposited on a, a silicon substrate, silicon oxide um, substrate, and this is just using the scotch tape method, very simple. Um, and what we have up here is we have an image of the topography in this. You can see the silicon oxide, you can see the graphene sort of tented over the material. Uh, over here is the AMFM, the, the um, resonant frequency measurement, and you can see that the silicon oxide appears uh, bright, meaning it appears stiffer, and the graphene appears uh, softer, so the uh, resonant frequency is lower over that. If we look at the loss tangent image, you can see that the loss tangent is smallest over the um, silicon oxide. And then over the graphene, it's sort of interesting. It has different structures. Um, on the edge here, the loss tangent is large, uh, implying there's a lot of dissipation occurring. And then uh, in the middle, or I'm sorry, towards the um, center of the, of the sheet, it, it gets reduced somewhat, but still higher than the silicon oxide. Now, we don't know exactly what's going on here, but um, the, the modulus of graphene, of course, um, is supposed to be quite large, uh, tera pascal or so. Um, and so the hypothesis here is that we actually have a small water layer under this. There may be more of that under this, um, that these edge effects, or these uh, edge, um, edge layers, uh, and that that this the uh, tip is basically measuring a sort of uh, graphene tent that's being held up by the little uh, silicon oxide tent poles underneath and so when you hit that side of the tent it appears softer and because there's probably some water or other uh, materials underneath it you're, you're dissipating energy. Here's another example this is uh, an elastomer sandwich so what I've done here is I've made a three-dimensional plot on this side, I've put, I've, I've colored the three-dimensional plot with the loss tangent. On this side, I've colored it with the stiffness measured by the resonant frequency. These histograms down below show you the, are, are associated with each image. Now, this, this was a sandwich, so what we did is we took two kinds of rubber. Um, we took a, a, a natural rubber and a latex rubber, and we just bonded them together with some epoxy and then cryotoned them. And so you can see here on this side is the rubber, here's the epoxy in between, and here's the latex. Now the loss tangent image shows the loss tangent of the epoxy is very low. It's about 0.01 or 0.1, excuse me. That shows at this peak in the histogram. The natural rubber has a relatively large loss tangent compared to the latex. Um, as you can see in this histogram, they're, they're clearly differentiated in that. And this is, um, this is exactly what we expect from uh, drop test results as well. Now the elasticity of these, new materi of these two materials is quite, are quite similar. So you can see here the latex on the color table here, you can't really see much of a difference between the rubber and latex. The histogram does differentiate them ever so slightly, but basically the Latex should be about 40 megapascal, and the rubber should be about 43.
So those showed a couple examples of Lost Tangent and AMFM. I'm going to back up a little bit, um, show the slide I showed before, and we're going to discuss how we get Lost Tangent information from the first resonance mode. A nice analogy to a tip tapping on a surface that we're all familiar with is a, a ball bouncing on a surface. Uh, it's not quite the same because there's not a cantilever attached to the end of that ball, but, but uh, there's a lot of similarities in this. So you're probably familiar with drop testing. In this case, we take uh, a ball bearing, and I hold it up there. I guess I should have tucked in my t-shirt. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we take a ball bearing, and we drop it from a measured height, and it hits, hits the ball here, or hits the uh, surface and bounces up. Now, if we look at the ratio of the energy that's lost in that process to the energy that we started out with, um, we get a measure of this loss tangent. Here's another material. Uh, where we've done the same experiment, but you can see that the, the bounce back height is much greater, which means that this lost energy is smaller, and the lost, that means the lost tangent is much, much smaller. We can apply the same energy considerations to um, tapping mode, to AC mode, and in fact that's um, been going on for quite some time here. I uh, just put this, uh, this picture of wood pulp that was first uh, shown by Don Chernoff way back in 1994 up there. Here's the surface topography and he noticed that the phase channel was giving him all sorts of interesting contrast. Um, since that time, that was 1994, since that time uh, people have tried to explain it. Jason Cleveland came up with a really nice uh, description of the energy lost, the, the energy that was um, dissipated by the tip sample interaction, and he showed that it was related to the sine of the phase angle uh, minus this ratio of the amplitude. So this A is the amplitude of the cantilever, and this A0 is the amplitude measured at some reference spot. Uh, Ricardo Garcia and group uh, also pointed out that the storage energy um, is, was, is related to the cosine of the phase. So we have sort of the lost and the stored energy. I should point out too that these little uh, bent brackets here mean that means that it's a time average. So we average over a cycle or two or ten or whatever to get these quantities. Well just recently we took these two early results and we made the hypothesis that the ratio of those two numbers is related to the loss tangent. And in the case that um, we're only measuring these short-range mechanical forces, that's the loss tangent of, those, of that viscoelastic material. You can do the math. Um, the full-blown expression is a bit more complicated than that, but I just took these two expressions here and divide it, and you get this expression for the loss tangent. Now, this expression is pretty neat because what you get out of this is a ratio of amplitudes and then phase angles. And I have to point out that what's, what's really powerful about this is that there is no optical lever sensitivity calibration in there. Because there's a ratio of, he of amplitudes here and a phase, which is basically a ratio of amplitudes, I can make this measurement without calibrating my optical lever. I could replace A with a voltage and a0 with a voltage, and I would, the, this formula still holds uh, just fine. One quick point on this is that, remember as you're thinking about this, this is just the ratio of the lost to the stored energy, so it really is just like this drop test I described a slide back, maybe two slides back, uh, where you're dropping the ball bearing. It impacts on the sample, and the sample tells us how much energy and how much and how much energy is dissipated, how much energy is stored by how far that ball ba bounces back up. Instead of measuring the ball height, we measure the amplitude and phase of the cantilever, but it gives us exactly the same information. So here's an example where we applied this formula to a sample that was a, a polypropylene matrix with a soft rubber elastomer um, blended in. Up here is the topography image, and you can see the polypropylene matrix, and these little ponds here are the elastomer. Uh, they appear slightly depressed in the uh, image. This, this sample was cryotomed. Uh, 
this is the phase image, so you can see there's lots of nice phase contrast. Um, we took the phase and the amplitude Im information and calculated the loss tangent data, which is on this graph right here. Uh, and you can see that the grayscale here ranges from somewhere close to zero up to 0.25. Now, in this calculation, there is no tip shape, there is no nothing um, as far as um, the optical lever sensitivity or anything like that. It was just this formula, which was the ratio of the amplitudes and the phase phases. When we, ex uh, when we compare these results, so this is a histogram. It shows the loss tangent of the polypropylene, this big peak down here, uh, about 0.05, and the loss tangent of the rubber elastomer about 0.25. This compares really nicely with um, room temperature DMA results that were time temperature superposed um, up to 250 kilohertz. Now, of course, sometimes there's a lot of controversy about these kinds of uh, conversions, uh, but in this case, uh, it seemed to agree quite well. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the first mode. Now we're going to look at the second mode, and, and specifically we're going to focus on how we get the elasticity or the stiffness. I prefer to actually use stiffness. I should probably change this, but the stiffness out of um, the second mode. And again, to remind you, the amplitude of that second mode is tiny, super tiny compared to the amplitude of the first mode. And really, we, we make it that way so that the second mode essentially acts as a probe of the of the interaction. It doesn't modify the dynamics, it just probes the dynamics. To probe the uh, dynamics of a sample, we chose uh, this ternary blend. So this is, again, this polystyrene, polyethylene, polypropylene matrix. And um, it's been cryotome. As you can see, this is the first mode image. I'm not going to bother to show the, um, the loss tangent right now, but um, you can see here the topography. And what's nice about the sample is that the three components can be identified just from the topography. So the polypropylene matrix um, background is right there. You can sort of see that there. These little inclusions are the polyethylene matrices. And then a little bit harder to see, but they'll certainly show up in the elasticity mapping, is the polystyrene. And those, um, those moduli uh, were made from time temperature superposed um, DMA measurements. So these are at 250 kilohertz. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to land uh, on this thing. We're going to turn on the first mode, just like we would do for imaging, and run a feedback loop. And then when the feedback loop is happily running on that first mode, we're just going to sweep the frequency of the second mode and see what we get. So we land first, or actually we don't land, we're just up it, um, just tuning the uh, the the second mode, and what we see is this curve right here. It's a nice looking harmonic oscillator. It's about 1.565 or something megahertz. Um, now what I'm going to do is pick a bunch of points uh, on the polyethylene. So I just go above these different points um, and tune, and what I get is this these series of tunes here. And what you see is that they're the, the there's a difference in the peak frequency. There's a delta frequency between the free and the polyethylene. Now, if I repeat that experiment over the polypropylene and the polystyrene, I see that not only do the peaks shift, but it's kind of nice. I get a shift that is different on average between the three materials. So what that means is that I am getting some sort of a stiffness map um, over this. Now we can, we can be um, a little bit more quantitative about that, and we can, we can expand the simple harmonic oscillator. This is a, a formula that's very common in the non-contact and FM community. Basically, the shift of that second mode divided by its, its uh, nominal, so the shift, this distance here, divided by that peak frequency, is going to be related to the ratio of the stiffness of that second mode to the stiffness of the, of the tip sample interaction. So I can now take this, if you recall back to the slide where I showed you the, uh, the apparatus,
instead of doing tunes at each point, I'm just going to run a phase lock loop, which keeps the phase of that second mode at 90 degrees, and I'm going to make a map of the frequency over those three materials. And it looks like that when we get it. You can see here on this axis, I hope you can see, um, this is the frequency of that second mode. So it goes from about 1.157 megahertz up to 1.586. Uh, so there's maybe a kilohertz or so of range in there. And um, it clearly differentiates these... these um, I should also note that since this is tapping mode, the resolution can be quite high. Uh, if I just take that, that uh, image that we uh, looked at in the previous slide and I zoom in on it, what I can see is if I look at the stiffness map, I can actually start to uh, resolve the individual lamella uh, in, the, um, in the polypropylene matrix. We see them in the polyethylene as well. Uh, and these have been observed before. They're, they're standard, um, uh, standard uh, structures in these materials, um, but it's, it's nice to see that, that we can image them uh, with the same high resolution that you expect from tapping mode. We've had a lot of interest in converting stiffness measurements into modulus uh, measurements uh, for an image. Uh, it's a bit of a dangerous game because there are some, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of unknowns about the tip shape. Uh, that can have dramatic effects on the values you measure. Nevertheless, I'm going to take you through a process to do this. Um, I showed you this expression before, which relates the frequency shift to the tip sample interaction spring, so the stiffness of the sample, um, and then the stiffness of, the, our, uh, of our spring, of our cantilever, and then the resonant frequency of that cantilever. Um, also, Hertz the Hertz formula for that spring constant, it's related to 2 times the contact radius uh, times this modulus. So we want to get that modulus out. Uh, we do a little bit of algebra, and we can come up with this expression for the modulus uh, in terms of these, of these expressions. Now, the frequency we understand pretty well. The spring constant we can calibrate. The contact resonance is pretty darn tough to know. I mean, I can type in a number and, you know, it may be right, it may be wrong. Well, it'll almost certainly be wrong. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do the following. We're going to rewrite this expression in terms of um, instead of having all this contact resonance or contact radius and so on in it, we're just going to give it a constant. And this constant is going to depend on the set point, the free amplitude, it's going to depend on K, it's going to depend on the resonant frequency, everything else. And we'll just leave that, that um, frequency shift outside. So this is something that we need to calibrate or calculate. Um, and whether or not this works uh, all depends on how well we know that number. So we have a little control panel where you can do that. You can, you can um, enter in this, this uh, um, function and so on, or I'm um, sorry, uh, coefficient. Um, so if we would like to extract a quantitative elasticity value, a modulus value, um, there's a few options open to us here. And sort of increasing complexity, the first and the most simplest, is if we have a, a, a material where it's a multi-component material and we know the modulus of one of the components, we can just take that pre-factor, that C factor, and adjust it to make that known component correct and then read off the rest of the materials on that, on that material. I'll show you an example in a moment where we did, where we did that. Uh, the second method, which we'll also look at, is to have a reference material. So a reference material where we understand or know the uh, modulus and we uh, try to correlate that. I'll show you an example of that. Third sort of goes beyond the scope of this talk, but we can take, um, you know, there's theoretical models for Hertz, DMT, JKR, Oliver Farr, and so on, where we can take that theory, we can look at the dynamics of an oscillating cantilever, and we can try to work that stuff out from first principles. That's fairly complicated. Um, it may be an exciting thing for some theorists to, to work on, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So method one, adjusting a prefactor to make um, to a known component to make a known component be correct. Uh, we just did this. We knew what the uh, what the spectra uh, 
uh, should be in this case. So this is an image of a spectrofiber embedded in epoxy and then cryotomed. Uh, the spectra, we adjusted this prefactor so that the spectrofiber here had a modulus of about 1.5 gigapascal and then read off the epoxy value and got a value of about 3.5 gigapascals, which according to the manufacturer is, is certainly a reasonable uh, number. I think they said nominally between 2 and 5, so uh, somewhere in there. Um, we can also go to a reference sample, so the second method here. And for this reference sample, we chose this ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, which is something you can buy in 50-pound lots from NIST. Uh, NIST measures it, and you get a, a Young's modulus of 1.3 gigapascal. There's actually a lot more significant figures in the, in the report you get. Um, but then what we can do is we can cryotome this and use it as a reference material uh, uh, that then can calibrate the cantilever so that we can measure uh, the elasticity of other materials. So to explore this reference sample method, I'm going to go back to the ternary blend sample. Uh, the image here shows, uh, again, another second mode uh, frequency shift image. You can see the polystyrene here, it's brighter, polypropylene intermediate, and, and polyethylene here. If I just go ahead and make a histogram of that, you can see that's more or less what you'd expect from this. Take the same cantilever and at the same set point, same drive amplitude and everything else, I'll engage on the reference sample and get this image. So this is a reference sample. You can see there's some structure in the image. Um, there's some, some deviation in it. But on the histogram, you can see the, the frequency shift here. And what's nice to see right away is that this frequency shift over the, the supposedly softer stuff indeed is at a lower frequency. I'm going to plot these values. So on this axis is the frequency, sh or the resonant frequency of that second mode over these different materials. So we start with the polystyrene up here, that's, that's the highest resonant frequency, then the polypropylene, then the polyethylene, then the ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. I'm also including the free air resonance. That's something um, when I tune the cantilever above the surface, that's a presumably a modulus of zero. It's not tapping on the surface at all. Um, and, and so I can include that point in this. So let's, let's see how we can apply this onsots, this uh, molecular or modulus map um, uh, onsots to this data. Uh, this is the plot from the previous page. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to fit it to a free line, a, a straight line, because this constant c uh, is just the slope of the stiffness, the elasticity. Sorry, the elasticity, not the stiffness. The modulus versus the the frequency. So the first line I'll fit is just using all materials. Now I'm pretending that I don't know what the ternary blend is, but I do have some idea what those values are. Uh, so I'm just going to fit it to that. I get this nice straight line here, this green straight line. If I pretend I don't know those values, if I only use this reference ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene and the free amplitude, I get this red curve. And you can see the slopes of those two things are different. And so what that tells me is that if I only use this reference, I'm not going to have uh, quite the same modulus differences. So that might be troubling. Um, if we make a histogram of that, though, we see that it's not a huge effect in this case. Um, here's the peak for the polyethylene. So that basically is about the same 2.1 something. Uh, the polypropylene gets shifted a little bit between those two um, there, but it's still very close to 2.5 or 2.6. The polystyrene is the worst, and that gets shifted by maybe as much as 10 or 20 percent. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still uh, pretty heartening. I should... Okay, I have a few minutes left. I want to tell you about a couple of exciting new developments. The first involves high-speed imaging. Uh, you may have seen our webinar on high-speed, low-noise measurements a few months back. Uh, if you haven't, you can catch it on our website. The basic idea there is to, by using small cantilevers, we can increase the signal to noise and, maybe more importantly, increase the response time, or decrease the response time, increase the measuring bandwidth. Uh, if you look at a cantilever, you'd think a cantilever with a resonance frequency of, say, 300 kilohertz would be very fast. Um, however, the response time, which I sort of 
have shown here with this tau, uh, doesn't only depend on the resonant frequency, it depends on the quality factor. And so a quality factor for a typical cantilever that's at 300 kilohertz might be 200 or 300 or something like that, which means that this cantilever has to, as it goes, say, over a, a cliff, has to ring up and down 200, 300 times before it, it detects the bottom of that, um, of that cliff. And so what that means is that even, even um, very high frequency cantilevers can have slow response times. Typical, typical cantilevers, even with a, a Q of, um, or a frequency of 300 kilohertz to maybe half a megahertz with a Q of 200 to 500, uh, you still only get about a, a kilohertz of bandwidth. Now with AM-FM measurements, where we're trying to combine this with stiffness um, measurements along with the, the standard first mode topography, you have to think about the uh, second mode as well. Fortunately, because the Q factor typically doesn't grow that much as you go to higher modes, uh, we're usually dominated uh, by the response time of the first mode. The second mode is almost always much faster than the first mode, at least as far as I know it always is. Um, the other consideration with, uh, with the, the AM-FM technique for measuring stiffness is that some of the fastest cantilevers we have, so that where the first resonant frequency is up around 5 megahertz, uh, we can't access that second mode yet. It's somewhere up there, but it's, it's with a, a diving board that's at 5 megahertz, it might be as high as 30 megahertz, so we, we don't have access to those cantilever modes yet. I'm only going to show one example of high-speed elasticity mapping um, using small cantilevers, uh, and and this is on a another epoxy. It's another um, elastomer sandwich. Uh, there's in in this uh, image here. There's epoxy on one side, and this viton plastic on the other. So it's not exactly an elastomer. It's a fairly stiff. It's two stiff plastics. Uh, I should note that the topography in this um, in, in these images are, is actually quite rough. It's many hundreds of nanometers, so this is actually a pretty challenging sample to image rapidly. Uh, this image was taken at 2 hertz, and this image was taken at a line scan rate of 20 hertz. So this image here took about 2 minutes, 8 seconds to finish. Uh, this image here took about 13 seconds. And so this histogram here shows the separation between the two materials. So that epoxy again is about three and a half uh, gigapascals modulus. The viton, oh I'm sorry I have it mixed up. The viton is about three and a half gigapascals. The epoxy is about five. Um, and what we can see here, the thing to note from this, is that as we go to higher and higher speeds, the separation between those two components gets, um, starts to degrade. And that's not too surprising. Uh, they start to, our signal to noise goes, um, becomes worse and worse as you go higher and higher in speed. Uh, nevertheless, at 20 hertz, we can still clearly differentiate these two materials. And it may be that if you do care about making surveys over a wide range of of um, materials or a wide range of um, uh, samples, uh, you may, you may, this may be useful. To get the best results, the re best resolution, of course, going slower will, um, will help with that. OK, to finish up this um, quantitative modulus section, um, I'm just going to point out a couple things that you have to uh, keep in mind when doing this. Uh, first of all, you should be in repulsive mode. That means that the tip is sampling mostly the repulsive uh, tip sample interactions. We have a really nice metric with this, with the phase channel. So by keeping the phase less than 90 degrees and preferably more like 40 or 30 degrees, um, uh, you know you're in repulsive mode. You should exercise good AFM practicing. So make sure that you're tracking the surface very well. You know, the feedback is uh, you're avoiding parachuting and other, other things. The other thing that's a little bit unusual with both these techniques is that they require careful tunes. Now, I was reading something the other day on LinkedIn, I think, about how tuning was somehow a difficult thing to do and we should, you know, it's really great if you don't have to tune. I mean, what we've done here is we've traded one kind of calibration for another. If you want to do a force curve and you want that force, force curve to be quantitative, you need to very carefully calibrate the optical lever sensitivity. You have to be able to convert the volts of the detector into nanometers of deflection.
in this case, for both of these techniques, we don't have to do that. What we've done is we've traded that kind of a calibration for a tune calibration. We have to be on resonance, and we have to have our phase offset set so that at resonance you're at 90 degrees. Um, and that is actually, in my experience at least, um, a heck of a lot easier to do than a, than a reliable optical lever calibration. Given that the name is the Atomic Force Microscope, um, it'd be sort of nice to measure a single atomic force. Um, and so one of the tests for AFM in, since the beginning has been the resolution of individual defects in an atomic lattice. Here we show um, two images, topographic images of the calcite surface with a single defect visible in the middle. Um, this is topography and these images were taken with a UHF arrow lever tapping in fluid um, and these images were taken about three or four minutes apart. There were about five or maybe as many as ten images in between that. Um, you can see that maybe the contrast has changed a little bit as the tip modifies and changes. Uh, but to get you an idea that this was a stable, um, a stable defect that we were able to resolve. At the same time we were imaging it in topographic mode with the first mode of the cantilever. We were measuring the stiffness with the second mode and that map is shown right here. The, you can see that in the valleys that I've illustrated with this little line here, uh, the second mode is measuring a higher stiffness, which makes a certain amount of intuitive sense. Uh, and on the peaks um, along, say for example this line here, uh, it's measuring a lower resonant frequency, which uh, means that it's a, um, a softer appears to be softer. Uh, if we draw circles around uh, the defects that were in the topographic image, we can see that there's also contrast in the stiffness channel. Uh, and in fact, that these defects appear, these single atomic defects appear stiffer uh, in uh, to the second mode. Taking that same data set, um, I just made a couple sections through it and plotted, plotted those here. Um, the top is in blue, bottom is in red, and I overlaid those two on top of each other. Uh, the vertical scale here is 50 hertz, and the lateral sc scale is 1 nanometer um, per, per bump, more or less. Um, what we see here is there's a significant change in both the images, and again, in these images are 5 or 10 apart. Um, there's this significant increase in the stiffness over that, that little hole in the, uh, in the sample. Okay, we've come to the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank you for uh, staying with us. Um, a few conclusions to, uh, to go through. Um, I mean, the first is that tapping mode has been around forever, and the fact is it works. It's fast, it's easy, you get high resolution, it's a really powerful technique. Lost Tangent and AFM now bring the possibility of quantitative nanomechanical measurements to these techniques. Using that same technique that you've used for your entire life maybe, um, now we can look at Lost Tangent and we can look at stiffness and in, even in some case the modulus mapping of, of materials with this. I showed you a bunch of examples, uh, hopefully enough. Um, uh, some, some mostly with polymers. We looked at a high-speed image, um, and there's many more that you can see on our website. Uh, basically, you can s image very rough samples and still get modulus, um, uh, modulus uh, measurements or stiffness measurements. I discussed some of the uh, implications and, and the challenges with modulus mapping, particularly the tip shape. So even though we have fun functionality to do this, I caution you to use it sparingly and carefully because the modulus is an extrinsic, an intrinsic property and our tip is not very good at measuring those things. It changes and we don't know what that contact area really is going to be. Finally, I finished up with some high resolution work. Um, I, I guess I showed you earlier the polypropylene lamellae, but maybe more excitingly the uh, single point atomic defects uh, that we're able to see in the calcite calcite lattice. If you'd like more information on this stuff, we're going to be all over the place. Um, there's a series of conferences and workshops that we'll be at. Um, 
that I, I've listed here. So starting in June in a, in a couple days, uh, we'll be at UIUC, then uh, Toronto, Santa Clara, we'll be in Paris, um, see you in Cancun, <laughs> I guess. Uh, we'll be in Pennsylvania, I should say in the, in the late fall, November, We'll be having a nanomechanics class here in Santa Barbara. Uh, we've put on one of those before, and it's been it was well received and well attended. Uh, there's also application notes on our website, and this webinar uh, will also be archived on our on our website. Thank you very much. So that ends the uh, regular presentation, and we're going to we're going to move on to questions. We've got some uh, questions that some of you have sent in that. Uh, that we will get to as time allots. Uh, the first question is, uh, in proper measurements of stiffness and loss modulus, we normally use sine, uh, I think he basically means sine to, to indent the surface. It has to be linear and otherwise results obtained in, in tip movements are not true and bear massive errors. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so we've had a couple questions um, on this subject. So basically, I think it boils down to when you impact the surface in tapping mode, you're exciting more than just that fundamental uh, frequency. You're, you're exciting a, a range of frequencies. That's one place where I'm going to bring up, a, I think I have a reference here. So when we, um, I hope everyone can see that. Uh, this is from the, the paper on lost tangent imaging. And this expression right at the top here, um, I think this is visible. This expression at the top, equation number four, um, includes um, the effect of the higher harmonics. So we actually do account for the energy, both the energy stored and the energy lost in those, um, in those higher harmonics. If you look at this graph down here, um, right here uh, on figure one, you see that uh, the effect of higher harmonics is most important for quality factors that are small. So the errors associated with not accounting for those uh, harmonics goes up as the Q goes down. Uh, finally, this, this figure two shows a, a, an expression, or a, uh, the results of some calculations where we, uh, we take this equation and we, um, we use successive harmonics, and you can see as you go up through the second mode, uh, the loss tangent approaches the theoretical, uh, the theoretical value. I should say the, the, these particular results were all done with uh, the VETA um, simulation tool from nanohub.org. Um, Arvind Raman's group at Purdue uh, set this up. Thanks. Okay, we've got a few questions that I combined. Uh, basically, all of them were asking about whether you can do this in liquid, whether there's any issues, whether you can do it on cells. Okay, well, uh, sure. Um, I mean, these results, um, let me put this. I mean, these results, the calcite, for example, were all done in liquid. Um, there's multiple other examples of that. We do have some challenges with driving high frequencies in liquid, um, and so there's, there's some issues with that. But other than that, yeah, sure, it works. Uh, you do have to take into account the low quality factor. So in the answer to the first question, uh, the errors associated with harmonics become much more important. And again, this is combining a few questions, but there's several of you out there that asked uh, whether they can do this on their current Asylum Research hardware. Good question. <laughs> I guess we have to care about that. Um, so the only requirement for the current, uh, both MFP and Cypher users out there, is a new high-frequency cantilever holder. And the high-frequency cantilever holder is required simply because uh, for FM mode, uh, you want the transfer function between the drive piezo and the cantilever to be as smooth as possible. If you have a lot of um, structure in that, meaning resonances and anti-resonances in the, in the drive, then you get a lot of coupling between the amplitude and the frequency, which uh, causes a lot of artifacts. So these new high-frequency um, holders are very, very smooth and uh, work for uh, high frequencies. <laughs> 
So another question asks, so lost tangent should be obtainable with regular AC imaging, not just AM, FM. Uh, also, what effect does working slightly off resonance have on the ability to determine the lost tangent? Okay, yes, um, that that is correct. It should work with, it's basically something that works in the first mode. I don't know if in this paper I have this. But so this equation two here shows you what you have to calculate <laughs> if you want to uh, if you want to work off resonance. So in this case, this expression here involves this omega squared over omega free, and that allows you to plug in any omega you would want. So theoretically, if you have a nice smooth transfer function to your cantilever, you can go anywhere. I should note though that there are some uh, assumptions in the optical lever sensitivity that you have to account for in this, and especially that uh, first expression in the in the uh, uh, numerator here uh, does not cancel out. So you don't get this beautiful independence from the optical lever calibration. Uh, so somebody else asked that there are a lot of examples on polymers. Do we have any examples on harder materials like metals or or ceramic coatings yet? Uh, so, you know, we do have a few examples. I don't know. Let me see if I can. Uh, yes. The answer is, short answer is yes. We've been paying most attention to um, polymers just because we have a lot of interest in that. This is actually sort of a polymer sample, but you can see here this is a uh, packing packaging material, so it's uh, designed to maintain the temperature and moisture and so on of uh, whatever was inside this uh, at, at nice constant values. And you can see here that this image over here, I think the pointer will work, yeah. So this, on this side, this is um, some sort of polymer. This is the tie layer, which is a flexible soft layer that connects the rigid layers. Here's another polymer. This over here is aluminum. It also has some some stuff on top of it, probably um, water that uh, dried from, or that, uh, yeah, that dried from the uh, cryotoming. But so here we see a very clear frequency shift. The metal is very, very stiff, so the frequency shift is high and the polymers are low. So it does work on uh, metals and harder materials. You do have to um, take into account the, the, the greater stiffness, though, and it may be that the, the um, the contact area of the cantilever tip in the two different kinds of materials will be different. Okay, the uh, question from the mathematician from Down Under. Uh, the response time of FM is independent of quality factor. Does this mean that the measurement time is limited by AM operation of the first mode regardless of the Q of the second mode? Uh, well, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. I, to tell you the truth, we have not proven that experimentally. What we have noticed is that if I'll just bring up an example here. I think this is from the talk. Um, did I just buzz by it? Yeah, here we go. Where is that? No. There, this slide. I mean, what we do see frequently is that in the second mode, uh, the, the second mode, the quality factor is doesn't grow as high, and, but the resonant frequency goes up, so the response time in the second mode is much faster. So time and again, we see much more spatial resolution in the second mode than we do in the first. What we haven't done right now is see if, when we turn on the FM loop, if it, if it becomes even faster. Maybe so. Um, right now, experimentally, that hasn't been, that hasn't been proven. Okay, this is a question about sample roughness. You've mentioned the effects associated with the difficulties of controlling the contact area due to the tip shape, but the sample is also important. Uh, the examples you've shown have topographical features quite clearly. Isn't that affected? Isn't that affecting the ultimate calculated stiffness? Definitely. That's kind of a simple answer, uh, and that's that's one of the reasons. Uh, you know, with a lot of the stuff going around with force curves right now, fast force curves, uh, with these kinds of measurements, you have, to, you have to take into account that contact area. And the sample roughness will change that contact area. And therefore, if you use the simple stiffness measurement you make to, to make a modulus measurement, you'll get the number wrong. So that's, that's why we try to be very careful about that. And while we try to do it on samples that are as smooth as possible, if we want that to be a, a quantitative uh, value.
So I think that's uh, going to wrap it up. Uh, we've covered, uh, I think, all the online questions. Uh, so there actually were a few questions, people asking uh, uh, whether they could get a recorded version, people that came in late. And so by following the same link that got you here for the live version, you can later return to the archive version and watch it as many times as you want. Uh, so that's going to conclude today's presentation. We're going to be sending out some information to you later on uh, the second and then the third presentation in this series. I want to thank everyone for attending and thank Roger for presenting. Thanks a lot, Jason. Um, if there are other questions and you sent them in, we'll take a look at them afterwards and try to follow up with you. Thanks very much.